Hi everybody, uh, this is Alejandro here, uh, here for your NASA 2023 year in review. Hope you guys are doing great. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started here and we'll go ahead and jump right in to talking about the newest or the the year of amazing stuff that has happened for NASA and its partners. So, all right, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Alejandro. Uh, I'm Texas A&M class of 2019, a whoop, uh, major in architecture and minor in astrophysics. Uh, just because I'm an architect though, doesn't mean uh, obviously that I'm just into architecture. I am super into space. I have done uh, a lot of outreach and a lot of events for space and uh, for uh, the aerospace genre in its entirety. Uh, also technology and cars. Uh, I'm super interested into airplanes and that's actually how I got into spacecraft and spaceships. Uh, I'm super into cars and I'm also obviously super into skyscrapers. Uh, but yeah, uh, here are a couple photos of me. Uh, one of me in the EMU mock-up, the extravehicular maneuvering unit mock-up, a little jetpack that astronauts use to go around the space shuttle and the space station and future spacecraft and then that is also on the right a picture of me uh, doing a presentation uh, about the physics about the uh, construction of a little test stand for the rocket engines on model rockets uh, specifically Estes model rockets uh, that was part of my position as the vice president of students for the exploration and development of space Go ahead and join if you guys are, uh, if any of you are on campus anywhere uh, on a, in a major university, see if you guys have a chapter or make your own. It's a fantastic organization if you're into STEM and specifically space related uh, topics. So at the beginning of these presentations, I usually like to get into a little bit of stu uh, news in space, uh, super cool stuff happening. Uh, this week, this past month, whatever. Uh, one of those things is the Rocket Lab launch. So Rocket Lab had a little bit of a mishap and didn't get their payload to orbit on their last launch. This was their return to launch and it went successfully. Whoop, fantastic. They sent a few satellites into space and everything worked perfectly and they are moving forward into 2024 with this successful launch with new contracts, new missions, and the hopes of their Neutron fully reusable rocket to be successful and fully uh, cap fully operational in 2024. Then another thing that happened was the X-37B finally launched. Uh, after a couple launch attempts and a delay, they finally figured out how to get the thing off the pad and the Falcon Heavy carrying this Air Force space plane launched off of Cape Canaveral and put the space plane into orbit to do something. No one really knows what it's going to do except for the noggins over at the Air Force or specifically the Space Force. But hopefully uh, they'll get some good data and of course the Falcon Heavy went off without a hitch. It was amazing. Side boosters were recovered. The center booster was expended, as most of those center boosters are, uh, and then it was quickly followed up by the Starlink 6-36 launch. This was another set of Starlink satellites going into orbit, and of course, successful recovery of the booster. Uh, this is a picture of the Falcon Heavy boosters with the Starlink 636 going off in the background, courtesy of SpaceX and uh, or through space.com. So fantastic launches uh, this week and this caps off the 96th flight of uh, of SpaceX for this year. That's 96 rocket launches just in one year. Absolutely incredible cadence and launch frequency from SpaceX and the rumor, well, the tweet that Elon put out uh, referenced this and said that they are looking to put 50% extra 
payload into orbit next year. So not including Starship. So that's going to be super exciting to see. See if they can get more cadence. Maybe they can break the triple digits. 100 launches in one year. Already 96 is a record for any launch provider. 100 will just be an absolutely astonishing record to see them set. Speaking of Starship, though, IFT-2 went off in November. Then uh, before that, we had IFT-1. And now we have IFT-3 getting ready. So Booster 10 and Ship 28 are currently going through, going through testing to see if they can get ready for a launch for IFT-3, the third integrated flight test. Uh, this is a suborbital test, just like the last two. Hopefully, it will be better than the last two. IFT-1 got off the pad, but not much farther before having a rapidly unscheduled disassembly. IFT-2 got off the pad, and then to booster separation, main engine cutoff, well, mostly main engine cutoff, I guess M-M-E-C-O, M-Miko, <laughs> uh, where all of the engines on the booster except for three were cut off and then it flipped. It tried to reignite 10 more engines at the bottom for a total of 13, but a couple of them didn't ignite and it uh, triggered the automatic flight termination system. The ship almost made it through its burn sequence, but after losing communications at the very end of the second stage, well, the Starship burn, it triggered the AT, uh, AFT, Automatic Flight Termination System, and kaputted itself. So, hopefully, this time, Booster 10 will make it to Miko, just like Booster 9 did, and then perform the flip and make it past reignition a restart of those engines until it lands, well, does a soft landing above the ocean in the Gulf of Mexico, and then hopefully Starship 28, SN28, will make it past its burn sequence and get all the way until the planned re-entry sequence somewhere over the Pacific Ocean to perform a re-entry and then soft landing, or the flip, the... <laughs> The, uh, what is it? the skydiving flip and then uh, kick f or sorry the skydive maneuver then kick flip and then land soft land on the ocean about a hundred miles north of Hawaii uh, if you guys need a refresher that kick flip will resemble the SN uh, 10 11 and 15 uh, starship prototype launches the suborbital launches to 10 miles uh, those kick flips hopefully it will emulate that and successfully land just like SN15 and to uh, show a little bit of that uh, where's my mouse come on there we go uh, to show the readiness of these boosters and starships booster 10 and SN28 completed a static fire Here's a static fire video from the drone cam, courtesy of the launch pad on YouTube. Absolutely incredible. And as you saw, you had the plume of fire coming from those 33 Raptor engines, which performed perfectly, by the way. A stark contrast to the Booster 7 static fires. And then that Booster Bidet, as people have been starting to call it, the flame uh, the, the flame protection system. I forgot the exact words right off the top of my head right now. Uh, where the water is getting shot out of a steel plate underneath the orbital launch mount and therefore protecting the booster and the orbital launch mount and the ground itself from the sound bouncing off those water particles. If you guys want to learn a little bit more that, about that, you could watch a few videos from the Mythbusters, from NASA, and curiously enough, Richard Hammond of Top Gear fame. He did a little bit of a <coughs> demonstration of that in his space shuttle documentary. Oh. 
So news over with, uh, let's move on to things that happened this year. So incredible year at NASA and its partners across the world. Uh, fantastic new scientific exploration missions, uh, scientific achievements, discoveries, and uh, mission achievements, mission milestones. So firstly, Psyche. Uh, we did a presentation about it a little bit earlier this year in, uh, well, I did <laughs> a presentation about it. Uh, Psyche is a probe meant to go look at an asteroid, specifically the Psyche asteroid. And this is one of NASA's premier mission, well, not the premier missions uh, like Cassini or Voyager, but a Discovery class mission that is uh, meant to explore new and interesting parts of the solar system that otherwise would not have gotten funding. Uh, so Psyche will be going to explore a very interesting asteroid about 170 miles wide where the asteroid is made up of a lot of metal. And this asteroid will be, uh, let's go here, uh, this Psyche asteroid, this is just an artist's representation by the way, uh, is thought to be a planetismal, a remnant of a planet that didn't actually form. So an allegory would be like the cent of a part of the center of our planet just floating out there in space. This might have lots of metals in it, a lot of uh, building blocks for life, who knows? So we're going to go send Psyche out there to investigate. And uh, the big news is that it launched up atop another Falcon Heavy rocket. Uh, here are a couple images courtesy of NASA. Uh, fantastic launch, went off without a hitch, and uh, Psyche is now on its way to complete its scientific uh, milestones, which are determining whether it's unmelted material or it's an actual core of a planetismal, uh, determining the relative ages of those regions of the surface of Psyche, uh, determining whether it incorporates the same elements as our planet. So we obviously can't go to our core, but we can see the various elements that are on our crust. And, you know, maybe Psyche has those same materials. And of course we have the, uh, the samples from uh, Mars meteorites that have crashed down onto Earth uh, over the course of millions and millions of years, and the moon rocks that we got from the moon missions. So that mission launched this year, and it will continue to go on through space. It'll do a Mars gravity assist, and then it'll head out to arrive at Psyche in August of 2029, and then it'll finally complete its mission somewhere around the last part of 2031. Now the mission might be extended after that, but they're right, just like with other missions such as the Mars rovers and the Jupiter missions, Cassini, you know, they, they set a, a target for this mission and right now it's November 2031, but if it continues going, maybe it'll uh, be extended through 2032 or 2035, who knows. Another mission that went out this year was Lucy. So Lucy is meant to go and explore the Trojan asteroids. So uh, we went over this in our other presentation as well. Jupiter has such massive gravity that it, its Lagrange points, which are gravitational points in space that are uh, able to have orbits around them, uh, can collect a lot of debris. and two of those, specifically L4 and L5, where on, if you think of the circle of Jupiter's orbit, right in front of it and right behind its orbit, going along with Jupiter, those spots in space have those Lagrange points and they collect a whole bunch of old asteroids. These are, you know, the trash of the solar system, just bits and pieces of dust, debris, rocks, etc., floating around, and it gets caught up in the gravity of Jupiter. And these pieces of debris and rock date back all the way to the creation of our solar system, back when the sun was just a ball of dust and gas, and the disk of dust and gas was around it that eventually became our planet, uh, or the planets of the solar system. So Lucy is getting sent out to explore a few of those asteroids, 
And one of the coolest parts of this year was its first asteroid encounter. Now, this asteroid encounter wasn't in the Trojan asteroid area. Uh, this was a main belt asteroid called Dinkinesh that we have been tracking for a little while now. And this was a test of the probe's systems, uh, one of which was the terminal tracking system, where within about 100 or 1,000 kilometers, you can't really use, you know, Earth-based radar. You need this, uh, the spacecraft to be able to track the object by itself. So as it got closer, it tested out its terminal tracking system and, you know, brought a couple of its science instruments online and discovered, hey, Dinkinesh isn't one planetary body. It's actually two planetary bodies just in a binary orbit of each other. Uh, fantastic discovery, really cool little surprise that they got. And they discovered that the larger body of Dinkinesh is about half a mile wide versus the smaller body, which is about 0.15 miles. So 790 meters and 220 meters respectively. Really, really cool little mission. Uh, hopefully we'll see the fruits of this mission later on in the 2030s when it actually arrives at the Trojan asteroids. And for more information about that, you can go to my other video about these robotic explorers. Uh, another robotic explorer that we didn't cover, really, was the OSIRIS-REx mission. Now, OSIRIS-REx was launched a long, long time ago, but this year, its major milestone was coming back to Earth. So, the spaceship itself didn't actually come back to Earth. As you can see, we're not taking a part of spaceship in this photo. What they were taking apart was the sample return canister. Now, this is the same as Hayabusa 1 and 2 from the Japanese Aerospace and Ex Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA, uh, which NASA helped on, uh, where OSIRIS-REx encountered the Earth gravitationally, but did not stop. It used Earth's gravity to slingshot it back into space, onward towards other missions. However, it left a little bit of stuff for us to find. So this sample return mission was a, was a heat shield with a canister inside of it, pretty much, that re-entered the Earth's atmosphere at, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of miles an hour, really, really fast. And it came in, it had a bit of a malfunction with its drug chute. Uh, NASA released an investigation report saying that a couple wires were crossed <laughs> while they were building it. The, the wires weren't labeled correctly, but everything turned out fine. It deployed its main chute correctly and soft landed in the desert and after recovery we got back over 70 grams of material from the asteroid Ryugu uh, which I've actually been reading about uh, I've been reading a book called Delta V by Daniel Suarez this asteroid is included in that book so uh, this asteroid was thought to be a carbon rich asteroid and these 70 grams of material and the 100 grams of material that they expect to pull out of the other parts of the uh, sample return canister show that it is indeed carbon rich, uh, specifically organic carbon rich compounds. Uh, they also show a lot of water in there, which is really, really, really good. Uh, means that one day maybe we can make Ryugu as part of a uh, space depot for us to uh, hang out, build stations around and use maybe and mine for building spacecraft, space stations around other planets, specifically gravity space stations. You know, we'll see. But basically they got the sample return. It was really cool. Uh, lots of stuff was inside of it, more than what they wanted. As I point out here, the goal was 60 grams. They're already 10 over and they're going to get 100 more, which is incredible. Uh, now, the issue with that is the canister itself was bolted down a little bit too hard, so they're having to fabricate new tools to unopen, or sorry, <laughs> to uh, unveil that material inside of the canister, and those tools will be ready in 2024, so hopefully in 2024 and over the course of the couple years after they open the canister fully, uh, we will get some more information, and the hope is that they will find actual amino acids. 
specifically the components of our DNA uh, or the, the building blocks of our DNA in those samples. So really great uh, mission, big shout out to uh, the Goddard Space Center, NASA, JSC, and the University of Arizona. Uh, many other uh, space agencies are gonna be getting this material as well. So hopefully someone will find something really, really interesting beyond what we've already seen. And speaking of stuff, uh, speaking of missions that continue going, as you can recall, I mentioned it did a gravity assist. Where is it going? Well, it's going to Apophis. So Apophis is an asteroid similar to Ryugu where it's going to be coming around in about 2029 and it's famous because this asteroid will pass within 20,000 miles for sp uh, for uh, relative ter in relative terms uh, geostationary orbiting satellites are around 25 to 30,000 miles so this is actually going to pass within the orbit of some of our uh, satellites. The moon, by the way, is 250,000 miles away. So this is within 10% uh, within of the distance of the moon. This is an incredibly rare occurrence. And uh, what's a little bit scary is that this asteroid, uh, because it's passing so close to us and due to its orbit, it's actually projected to pass through an area which contains a keyhole of gravity and this keyhole of gravity would allow it to swing back later on in the 2030s or 2040s to actually impact Earth. So OSIRIS-REx was retasked after it met after it left Ryugu to see if it can rendezvous with this Apophis asteroid when it passes Earth. So uh, OSIRIS-REx will obviously just passed us, will continue on and do uh, concurrently or consecutively smaller and uh, lower orbits towards the sun, six in total, before it meets back with us and specifically Apophis in 2029. And by then it will have enough uh, energy and enough uh, or have bled off enough energy to meet up and get into orbit around Apophis after which it will spend a few months orbiting Apophis, studying the gravitational perturbations that encountering Earth's gravity well will cause on the surface of the asteroid, and of course, monitoring to see, you know, whether it makes that keyhole, whether it uh, is made up of more solid materials or more uh, loose material, so that if we do indeed need to move it uh, before it hits us, we can send out a specific kind of payload that will nudge it correctly. Uh, we also had a mission that uh, impacted an asteroid, I believe, earlier this year or last year, but uh, we may have to do it again. <laughs> and uh, here's a picture of it on March 8th, March 9th, and March 10th. That's, that's the actual asteroid. The photo above is an artist's impression. Now, speaking of the sun and orbiting the sun, we also had an annular solar eclipse. Amazing. It was amazing. Uh, this was in October. Uh, this is a photo taken from a Dobsonian telescope, courtesy of my friend Blah Blah Bliam. Uh, he's a, an astronomer here in Texas who took this photo, got a little bird in the photo. <laughs> and it was a fantastic event. Lots of people participated and uh, got to learn about solar eclipses. Uh, one of the big reasons that solar system ambassadors such as I and other space enthusiasts are trying to put the word out is that this annular solar eclipse uh, was a pretty big event, but it was more of a lead up to the actual great American 2024 full solar eclipse. And that eclipse will be happening April 8th of 2024. Um, now, this is a news for 2023 uh, podcast, but I wanted to make sure and mention this. Uh, on April 8th, 2024, at around 1.40 p.m., the moon will obfuscate 
the entirety of the sun. This will be a full total eclipse and it will last about three minutes. Uh, from this picture you can see the path that this eclipse will be taking. So you can see it'll come up from the southern Pacific Ocean. It will hit the southwest coast of Mexico, travel up, up, and pass over Dallas, Texas, or a big swath of Texas as well. If you can't make it to Dallas, you can make it to Austin or San Antonio or Waco. Uh, and it will continue past and go up towards the northeastern seaboard, uh, up towards New York, Chicago. Uh, it won't hit Chicago, but if you're in Detroit, as you can see, if you're in Cleveland, you're gonna get a bit of a bit of a weird day. <laughs> so make sure and buy your solar solar eclipse glasses. Make sure to uh, ensure that those are actual glasses. Don't fall for scams and burn your eyes by looking at the corona. <laughs> And as I said, this will last about three minutes. So make sure and be ready, get your tickets now, find out where you're going, because it's gonna be a wonderful, incredible experience once in a lifetime. Uh, speaking of other once in a generation things, uh, events, Artemis II, the, uh, the first time humans will be going back to the moon in over 50 years is gonna be happening either December 2024 or December or early 2025. And big things that happened this year for NASA were the completion of the core stage with the four RS-25 shuttle main engines being uh, grafted and attached to the center core, that massive 220 plus foot tall center core of the SLS rocket. The second Orion capsule was completed and the program was uh, scheduled and put on track for that December 2024, early 2025 timeline. Uh, as part of that media blitz, that media campaign, uh, the four astronauts that will be going on Artemis II, uh, as I mentioned in a previous presentation, the Artemis II mission will be going around the moon and then coming back over a course of 10 days. They went to go see their spaceship. So here you are. Uh, this is, let's see here. So, oop, went too far. Uh, these are the four astronauts that will be going, two mission specialists, one commander, and one pilot, uh, Christina Cook, Reed Weissman, Victor Glover, and I completely forgot the, uh, the fourth astronaut, uh, the first Canadian to go to, go to the moon. Uh, I need to get my... Uh, cheat sheet here somewhere but basically they went to see their Orion spacecraft they got to see the uh, they got to sign the inside of one of the tanks that they will be flying on uh, really cool little photo shoot you guys should go check it out but basically they're gonna be heading out in again in late 2024 or early 2025 to complete the first flyby of the moon in over 50 years again once in a generation kind of event but hopefully not once in a generation after artemis accomplishes it uh, you know because artemis is designed to be the program that gets us back to the moon sustainably and permanently uh, more on that in my artemis presentation uh, from earlier this year now going way past the moon we've got ingenuity which is that little uh drone that flew off of Perseverance a couple years ago, if you remember, well, it's still flying. Incredibly, it's still flying. Uh, of course, Curiosity and Perseverance are also still working, which is awesome, but Ingenuity is the first flying machine that humanity has ever put on another planet, and it continues to fly perfectly, getting photos, doing uh, reconnaissance for the Perseverance rover, and doing science. So included is a uh, little flight log here along with the picture. Uh, it's done 69 flights, uh, over 125 minutes of flight time. It's flown over 10 miles so far, which is just like, I, I have trouble thinking about how, like how incredible, like wrap, like wrap your mind around the fact that we have a, not a quadcopter, but like uh, a helicopter, a remote control helicopter 
flying on another planet just doing science. And it's flown over 10 miles worth of flights. Obviously a few hundred feet at a time. But I mean, still absolutely incredible. 10 miles. Uh, maximum ground speed, by the way, of 22 miles an hour. Uh, for reference, by the way, uh, Usain Bolt, the fastest human on Earth, does around 27. So if you can imagine, 22 miles an hour is not super fast, but it's pretty fast when you're thinking about the fact that it's flying autonomously on a whole other planet. Just mind-blowing. Absolutely mind-blowing. Uh, 80 feet in the air, too. Uh, so highest altitude of 24 meters, about 80 feet. Now, if you want to think about that, 80 feet is the height of the tail of an A380 jumbo jet. So if you think about that, like that huge 550 passenger jet, super tall tail, like that little helicopter went from the ground on Mars, 80 feet in the air, seven stories in the air, flying around a little bit, taking some photos and then coming back all autonomously, just super, super cool. Now, a little bit, let's let's reel it back into Earth. You know, normal operations, normal, right? Uh, the commercial crew program continues to be an incredible asset to NASA's Human Space Flight Division. Uh, we've done two separate crewed launches over the course of the year, Crew 6 and Crew 7, to support Expeditions 69 and Expedition 70, uh, uh, 69 and 70, respectively. And then the Crew 5, ship returned as well as crew six later on in the year so crew six launched in march uh, crew five returned when crew six went up to the space station and then crew six came back late this year when crew seven went up so expedition 69 was the expedition for six months here on earth march through march april may april may june july august september through september <laughs> Just wanted to do a little math in my head there. Uh, Expedition 69 did that six months, and then 70 will be doing the six months from September. So that's October, November, December, January, February, March. So again, March, and Crew 8 will be heading out in that time frame to relieve them and get uh, Expedition 71 on track. So. Here are a couple pictures, by the way, uh, Expedition 69 and 70, the walkouts here, as well as the launch of Expedition 6. Oh, oh sorry, Crew 6 and Crew 7 uh, walkouts, as well as the launch of Crew 6 and the return of Crew 6 here on the bottom right. Sorry about that. <laughs> Getting all these numbers uh, flipped around in my head. Now. The ISS, as we mentioned, you know, keep keeps on going. Huge asset, 25 years. Uh, NASA celebrated 25 years of flying on the ISS, uh, doing over 3,700 science investigations. Ooh. Sorry, <laughs> uh, 3,700 science investigations from 108 countries. 273 people have visited from 21 different countries to the International Space Station, truly making it an international space effort. Uh, that includes, of course, multiple private astronaut missions, including Axiom 3, which went up this year as well. So incredible, incredible asset to human spaceflight, uh, an amazing part of humanity's history of exploration. All of these experiments that I talked about, the scientific investigations, almost 4,000 of them go to helping uh, discover new parts of human anatomy, understanding how our bodies and how other living things, how, how things in general uh, behave and react to microgravity environments, and then laying the bedrock, the foundation of our understanding of how to travel in space so that we can make our trips to the moon and eventually Mars much more easier, uh, much easier. <clears throat> now, 
All of that being said, fantastic year for NASA and its partners. 2023 won for the record books on multiple different fronts. Uh, we've got multiple robotic missions going out. We've got, uh, so that's Psyche and Lucy. Uh, we've got OSIRIS-REx coming back, delivering samples for the largest amount of samples, by the way, ever recovered uh, for uh, from an asteroid back to Earth. We've got progress on Artemis II, the first moon mission, manned or human mission to the moon in over 50 years. We've got a record setting, uh, it's a bit cold, uh, record setting cadence launch wise from SpaceX, Ni almost 100 launches, and they're going to beat that next year, hopefully. We've got the next steps of the Starship program uh, gearing up so that we can go back to the moon and actually land on the moon with Artemis 3, 4, and 5. And then, of course, we've got celebrating the ISS being up there for 25 years, giving us unparalleled access to information and unparalleled discoveries for microgravity environments. Just incredible. Uh, and, you know, that all leads into what we're going to be doing in 2024. Uh, 2024 is going to be an incredible year for space, and I can't think of any other way of showing you guys that than actually showing NASA's uh, outward or onward and upward video talking about the incredible things that they have in store for the next year. So let's go ahead and look at that. It's a new day in space exploration as we sail on this new cosmic sea there's so much to learn there's so much to be excited about american companies will soon land payloads on the moon for the first time these missions are really challenging and risky they're going to help us conduct new science Artemis is different from anything humanity has ever embarked on before. And we will discover life-saving, earth-changing science and technology along the way. We're delving deep into what science can be achieved by humans working together with robotic capabilities and future infrastructure to support a long-term human presence at the moon. The main purpose of the International Space Station is to perform science. The fact that we'll have two companies able to provide the opportunity to reach low Earth orbit, but it'll change the way we look at how we fly to space. And the more we learn about the Earth and the more we understand the processes that affect it, the better we can plan for the future. The needle nose jet, the X-59, it will revolutionize the aviation industry. We will show what is possible when we dare to reach distant cosmic shores. And we are in total solar eclipse, wow. and this is absolutely breathtaking. Onward and upward. Wow. <laughs> really, really cool video from NASA about what they're going to be doing in 2024. You saw some incredible stuff alongside the stuff that I mentioned, you know, Artemis II, the uh, Europa Clipper heading out next year to go to Europa to see if there's life in the universe besides us over on the moon of Europa. You've got the X-59. <clears throat> Again, as I mentioned, I got into airplanes first before getting into space. Uh, specifically, my first memory of school, uh, where I, I learned about airplanes and stuff, 
was sitting down in my first grade class uh, reading little pamphlets about the X-Plane program, you know, the X1, the X2, uh, the X3 with its needle nose, the X15 uh, blasting humans past Mach 6. Uh, the current actual record holder is the X15 for a Mach 6.7 flight uh, by Pete Knight back in the 60s. Like, just incredible program. And they're going to be doing the X-59, which is a, uh, as as uh, the administrator mentioned, uh, Mr. Nelson, <clears throat> sorry, clear my throat there. Uh, as Bill Nelson mentioned, the NASA administrator, uh, the X-59 will be testing whether it's possible to fly past the sound barrier without actually creating a very loud sonic boom, which is what did in a lot of other uh, supersonic transport concepts and <clears throat> and is the main reason why we can't actually fly supersonic over land. Um, these are problems that will be faced by many of the supersonic transport and airliner companies that are currently trying to build one, uh, such as Boom Supersonic. Uh, they just signed a whole bunch of contracts with United and a few other airlines. Uh, you know, the X-59 is going to see if we can prove if that's possible to do without shattering all of our windows <laughs> and setting off our car alarms. Uh, really, really cool. And as I mentioned, Europa Clipper um, and uh, Artemis II going back up. Uh, one thing that they mentioned which was super cool is that we're going to be doing the CLIPS missions. So uh, commercial lunar program, uh, commercial lunar, uh, and then the I stands for something. Uh, basically, it's the commercial lunar program. and what's interesting about that is it is an evolution of the idea of the commercial crew program and the commercial cargo program to the international space station uh, this program will be sending multiple different landers to return u.s companies and u.s machines back to the moon for the first time in 50 years uh, this year we've had multiple or over the past few years we've had a couple other nations join the ussr and the United States uh, as nations that have landed on the moon, specifically India and China. Uh, but the United States is going back not as a national effort, but as a commercial effort designed to fund and support commercialization of moon resources and moon research. <clears throat> Just a really forward-thinking and uh, exciting opportunity for this country to build more stuff in space. Uh, very, very excited about that myself. Uh, really, really excited to see if, you know, maybe uh, that opens up the stage to other companies saying, hey, maybe space economies can actually be profitable, can be interesting, can lead to bases on the moon, which would be really, really cool. Uh, and yeah, other Earth science missions, uh, big other milestones going to be coming up, but we can get into that later on in other presentations next year. Uh, but before that, for this year, I wanted to say thank you for joining me for my three other presentations uh, for this one. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, this was an incredible opportunity for me to uh, learn more about space, learn more about what we're doing and uh, distribute that information to you guys, uh, the public. These space endeavors can't happen without us, without the people being excited, without the people being uh, ready to go, ready to support these kinds of missions, because uh, NASA is a public institution. NASA is a representative of the United States, of the people of the United States. And it's my hope and uh, I think the hope of a lot of others, uh, which is why we do this, why we volunteer for the Solar System Ambassadors Program, which applications are open, by the way. Uh, I'll post the link later uh, down below. Um, these missions are a representation of who we are as a country, who we are as a people, uh, and who we are as humanity, uh, going out for exploration, for science, for discovery, 
and trying to understand not only where we come from, but where we can go. So thank you very much for joining me on this journey in 2023, and I hope to uh, put on more presentations and do more things in 2024. Uh, so see you guys at the Total Solar Eclipse in April, and uh, per aspera ad aspera.